That gets my goat. Hi, this is Big Anklevich. And this is Rich Outfield. Uh, I'm sure you've got a reason for that. And... Nine? No reason at all. Oh, that's good. Uh, no, I just wasn't prepared. <laughs> okay. I wasn't able to put on my Rich Outfield persona. <laughs> when you panic, you just downshift into that German accent. The fey German accent. Well, Your real accent comes out. Yeah. <laughs> This is That Gets My Goat. That's right. For us, it's been a while, hasn't it? Yeah, I think it's been a bit. Uh, oh, because we had so many uh, Avengers episodes. Yeah, we did that Mondo of Avengers episode. And there were still like 24 minutes of it I cut out. Yeah. And then you tagged on to the end of it as bloopers and uh, it all no, made it on there anyways. Like a, an 11 minute conversation that we had in the middle of that is an Easter egg. Oh, um, and then some of the rest I just deleted. Is and... that where we accidentally talked about sports? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it will never happen again. I assure you. <laughs> then we had the battleship D box experience, mm. which I believe is is has dropped already. Yeah, it hit uh, very recently. Uh, and I think our plan was for Avengers to go all the way up to when Brave came out, and it didn't. Yeah, well... I think the week that this is airing, Brave is coming out. Well, okay, tell me what you thought of Brave. I loved it. it. <laughs> I've, I've got a question for you. Um, if you could change your fate, would you? <laughs> would you now? Would you, punk? <laughs> I'm sure you're asking yourself. <laughs> so there has been other movies, though, this summer that we haven't talked about, mostly because we, I haven't gone and seen them, but you've gone and seen a lot of them, like Madagascar 3. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Holy crap, that made $60 million? Yeah, it made almost exactly what Madagascar 2 made on its oh, opening weekend. I feel And Ill. there's been this trend that the sequels have been opening smaller than the predecessors. Even if the predecessors were extremely popular, Kung mm -hmm. Fu Panda 2 opened at like almost half what Kung Fu Panda 1 did. And Happy Feet 2, yeah, totally bombed. It was like a third what Happy Feet 1 did. Cars 2, these sequels. But Madagascar 3 opened pretty well. They consider that a success. Yeah, I want them to stop that. But what you said a second ago, we live far enough apart and you work enough that we don't go see everything together. And, for example, I went and saw Prometheus, and it was $9 a ticket in 2D. <sighs> I didn't really even want to see it. <laughs> but my friend did, and we had talked a lot about the movie, the way that you and I talk about movies that we're anticipating. And just to be able to answer those questions, I guess, uh, we went and saw it. And then we talked about it afterward, but... It's not the same. I mean, this is the only outlet where I can share my opinions, my my lofty opinions with other people. Okay. Why don't you talk about Prometheus real fast? What uh, did you like or dislike about it? What, it's an alien prequel, right? It is. And Fox was really cagey about whether it was a prequel or not, whether it was its own thing. So the conspiracy theories flew. I'm sure you probably heard some of them, even if you weren't a big fan of Ridley Scott or whatever the deal is. And the question that I had before it came out was, was it intended to be an alien prequel? And the, right before they started shooting, did they pull back on some of that stuff? Because Ridley Scott was like, no, it's not. It's, it's nothing. No, it isn't. Those rumors are lies. Or was it originally a, a standalone science fiction story and somebody got their hands on it and said, let's make this into an alien prequel because I felt like it could have been either way. And it had two screenwriters, one who wrote one draft and one who came in to fix the draft. Uh -huh. uh, and I guess it, it was always uh, Ridley Scott for years and years wanted to go back and do another alien movie. And he used to always talk about, wouldn't it be interesting to go to the planet that the aliens came from and see what that's like? And, and then I guess somewhere along the line, they said, well, let's do this and and he got the idea of, let's divorce ourselves a little bit from the Alien franchise. That I, I, seems you know what? like I'm a sorry. weird I'm just, thing I've to just do. contradicted myself. The movie is a contradiction in that way. It tries to be its own thing, but as the movie goes along farther and farther and farther, it becomes more blatantly, uh, hey, remember this in Alien? Check this out. Don't forget that part in Alien. We're going to do that again. And until you get to the very, very end where it's like, hey, folks, big surprise. This is an alien prequel. 
And it was like, it wasn't a surprise. Did you guys have to hit us over the head with it? It reminds me of in episode three of the Star Wars prequels where Yoda looks over to Chewbacca and says, Thank you, Wookiees, for helping us. Especially you, Chewbacca. And you, there's a wink and you're just like, wow. That was like when Boba Fett turned to the camera and waved so people would notice it. I mean, we're, we're not... Stevie Wonder and Ray Charles aren't watching this movie. I mean, come on. Do you really have to smack us that hard? Anyway, that's that's what it felt like. It had this insipid little coda that our friend was explaining to me what it meant. And it, it, it made me angry that it was tacked on there in case we had been sleeping for the last two hours and didn't realize that this was an alien prequel. And then it still didn't make any sense because in Alien, one thing that's really clear is the life cycle of this damn alien, where it starts as an egg and it becomes a face hugger and the face hugger puts a seed in a person's chest and the chest burster comes out and eventually a chest burster becomes an adult. And for Ridley Scott to just toss that out in the end of this movie and say, oh, this is how they happen now, it makes zero sense to me. But, you know, that's fine. I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm acting like I absolutely hated this, the movie. And in a way I did, but it was also a really beautiful film. I mean, like all of the shots were kind of amazing and, and set up and pretty and the lighting was always really evocative and, and the special effects were, until that coda, absolutely awesome special effects. I, and, and we've had special effects conversations a lot and it takes a lot for me to go, ooh, ah, and these special effects weren't, ooh, ah, but they were the kind of special effects where you just follow the story and don't remember that it's a special effect. It's, right. It, you don't it, look at it and go, oh, what the? Or you go, oh, that was amazing. And, you know, everybody has a different agenda when they're making a special effects movie or, or a scene. And Scott's agenda in this seemed to be, well, we're just going to carry you along through this story. Mm -hmm. And you'll see, like, you know, almost like a... One of those old tunnel of loves you used to see on the cartoons uh -huh. the, where they'd be in the water in a gondola and it would go through all sorts of interesting visuals. And some of them were scary and some of them were beautiful just to give you a chance to get a hand job. And I wish that those existed now. Yes, hand jobs, not just tunnels of love. But it, it, it was it something like for that. some, just not you. You know, there were parts in Avatar where the movie just stopped. So that you could look around and say, wow, look at this or check this out. Isn't this neat? Have you ever seen this before? Right. You know, it's like, wow. And, and there would be characters that would just, their mouths would open, their eyes would get wide and they would look at things. And in those cases, I think Cameron was trying to get you to just say, check out these special effects or check out the wonder of this other world. Because it, it kind of worked hand in hand that Jake Sully was seeing these things for the first time, just like you were. But parts of Prometheus seemed to be on the verge of going past that, where suddenly it just became art. Uh -huh. it, you know, almost indulgent. You know what I mean? Where the style is, is more important than the substance. substance. And, uh, you know, that's fine. You can have both and things like that. It just seemed to me that had I cared more about these people, it would have been scarier and it would have been more impactful when they died horrible, horrible deaths. You know, that's a lesson that you can put in any movie or story or, or novel. I mean, unless you're Terrence Malick, it's good for the audience to care about these people, to be emotionally invested in these people. I mean, that's what we talked about for hours on Avengers, is we gave a damn about all these characters. And so when the big action sequences happened at the end, we gave a damn whether they got through it or not. And, and to me, I can't even remember a moment of special effects in Avengers where it was all about the special effects. All of the effects were in service to the story, right. or the action, or the characters. And I don't know, I'm, I'm biased because I respond to that. I respond to somebody hurting somebody that I love so that it feels all the better when that guy gets up and decks the person that hurt him. Other people really only care about a pounding soundtrack or fast cars or a billion CG characters on the screen at the same time to each their own. I don't know. Did you have any interest in seeing Prometheus before it came out? And now what are your thoughts? Have you talked to anybody else who saw it? I haven't. Uh, Prometheus, I don't know. It just didn't interest me. I've, uh, I've never been an alien fan to begin with. I think 
the first time I saw Alien was with you just a couple of years ago where we sat down a couple of weeks in a row and we watched Alien and then we watched Aliens. I don't think we watched Alien 3. I have seen Alien 4. That was my first Alien. Was that Alien Resurrection? Hence, you're not a fan. Yeah, I, I was never into Alien. I, I didn't see it. You know, there's certain things where you got to see them at like the right age. Same thing that happened to me with E.T., Everybody saw E.T. in 1982 but me. Everybody. I mean, you've seen how it grows. Every single person in the friggin' United States saw E.T. but me. And Guam. And Guam is a U.S. territory, so there you go. Oh. I didn't see it until I was in college. And by that point, I was too old to be all like, oh, E.T., wow. And yeah, I was just not the right age. And I think it was the same kind of thing with Alien. I was, it was too late. For You'd it to, seen it ripped off a million right. times. That was definitely the case with E.T. I was watching going, oh, psh, that's just like Mac and me. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> you know, I'd seen other stuff that ripped it off. Probably is the problem. I don't know, really, but it's not my thing. So I'm, I'm, it's not one of those franchises that I follow like many of the other franchises. So I don't really care to see Prometheus one way or the other. I've told you, and I've probably told the audience before, but hey, they need to be reminded of my cousin seeing Terminator 3 before Terminator 2 and feeling that Terminator 2 was an inferior ripoff of Terminator 3. He also saw Scary Movie before he saw Scream, and he didn't appreciate Scream because it wasn't as good as the movie it was ripping off. And so I guess I, I understand what you're saying with the the, and me. when you see it. I, I, it's hard, <laughs> though. You know, there's certain things that are timeless. I'm trying to think of an example, you know, like I, I was in my 30s when I saw Casablanca for the first time. Uh huh. Yeah, I was in my 20s when I saw Casablanca and I just thought, man, that was a good movie. Right. And then that's was the point I was trying to make. It, it was awesome. Yeah. And I, I showed my friend the 1968 Planet of the Apes after he had seen the Tim Burton one. And I, I was kind of afraid right. that he would be like, wow, that was so lame. And he was just like, dang, my generation got that giant turd and <laughs> and our parents' generation got this awesome movie. And I was like, wow, I was glad that he appreciated it. But every once in a while, you'll see something. Like, I think I told you, I couldn't make it through West Side Story. It just, I, I, I it offered me so little. Hey, it, when you're a jet... You're a jet. And it seemed so unbelievably dated and hokey uh -huh. that I couldn't get past it. Now, I, I don't know. Somebody else might see it and see the era that it's set in is, you know, some glorious thing that they can still respond to in the same way that if you saw a period Romeo and Juliet or whatever, you could still relate. But I just, I, I couldn't. And I don't know, maybe if I'd grown up with that movie or the songs. Yeah, or, I think that does make a difference sometimes. One movie that I saw way later than people normally saw this film was Nightmare Before Christmas. I didn't see that one until just a few years ago as well. I never saw it when I was younger, when it came out. The funny thing was, I got the soundtrack. I think I got it from you. Yeah. And I listened to the soundtrack for months before I ever saw the film for the first time. And I kept thinking... These are really cool songs. I like this soundtrack. I got to see the movie to this sometime. And, and wait, sorry, let me interrupt. Did it create in your mind an image of what this movie must be like that didn't match when you saw the movie? No, it was pretty close. I liked the movie a lot more than I probably would have otherwise, though. Oh, okay. I think because I listened to the soundtrack, I kind of knew the story before I saw the story, you know what I mean? So sometimes there was parts where it wasn't as clear, wasn't as easy to understand, or the little toy doll thing he's doing their thing didn't communicate stuff as well as I would have liked, yet I knew what was going on, so I was able to understand and be just fine and go along with it. So I think there's different ways that that can, that can happen. Perhaps if you had the soundtrack to West Side Story and you'd listened to that and knew all the songs and were all excited about, oh, this is that song, awesome, you know, kind of a thing, maybe it would have helped to overcome the other uh, issues that you had. I don't know. You know, it's hard to say, you know, certain things. Like, I'm not as big of a horror guy as you, and so seeing a horror movie of alien doesn't 
speak to me as much as it would speak to you. You know, depending on what you already got a, a, a bent for, it will make your experience with a film much better. Like when I go with my wife to see superhero movies, she doesn't come out of there and realize that she's Peter Pants in there because she was so happy and excited. But that happens to me all the time. Wait. Oh, crap. Oh, wait, OT's not here for these shows. Somebody's got to edit that out. But there are things that she responds to in that way. You know, the killer took off the woman's breasts and wore them as a hat, <laughs> you know, drenching in her blood and teat milk. And you're just like, oh, honey, how can you like this shit? Right? <laughs> I mean, from what you've told me, it's stuff like that. Everybody has their own things yeah, that they yeah, respond she, to. Yeah, she has her own things. Like the night and day of the way you responded to Pride and Prejudice oh, and the way she responded to Pride and Prejudice. She loved it, became like the hugest Colin Firth fan because of this show and has gone and seen every friggin' Colin Firth movie out there since then and really likes it whenever he plays a character that cl that's close to Mr. Darcy. I don't know that this is the perfect excuse to talk about this. I've tried to keep this away because women, well, you brought it to my attention, are real protective of this movie. <laughs> they uh, Female Star Wars, tread lightly. And yeah, I, the one time that I saw it was in a, a public place and I had borrowed my sister's portable DVD player thing and a, a, a stranger, somebody I'd never spoken to before came up to me and said, why didn't you tell me you were watching that? I mean, she screamed. She, she went into the red like I just did. <laughs> and I was just like... Because because I I don't know you. I, why would I have told a stranger? Hey, excuse me, sir. I'm watching porn. That sort of stuff doesn't happen. But it was just. I mean, she was just like, holy crap. You know, I, I, it was suddenly we were on the same page or something. I probably could have slept with that girl. I'm I'm not exaggerating. She just lit up that I would be watching this BBC miniseries of Pride and Prejudice, or or do people in America call it the A and E miniseries of Pride and Prejudice? I don't know. Fuck them. You know, that's that's just one of those things. And, and I told you of the guy the day that we saw Avengers that said, you know, the people I went to it with sure seemed to think it was a good movie. But he didn't. He didn't respond to it. He didn't. It didn't speak to him in the same way that it spoke to us. It wasn't really his thing. And it's spoken to a lot of people. I mean, by the time... He likes by the DC. Time, by the time, no, I, I don't think he likes any of that stuff. I don't know. I mean, maybe he liked uh, Eight Seconds or, what, you know, something like that. Do people still talk about Eight Seconds like it was a movie? Rudy. It was a movie? Anything. I thought you were talking was about a movie. just Eight Seconds, the concept of... Yes. He's very into the space-time <laughs> continuum <laughs> as it pertains to our plane. No, uh, he but... He really I, liked the Chernobyl Diaries, but... You know, I wanted to see Chernobyl Diaries, uh, but it didn't do well. And I guess that's what I was saying about Avengers is it did so extraordinarily well that my guess is that most people that saw it really liked it. That, it, you know, it didn't just speak to Joss Whedon fans and it didn't just speak to Marvel files. You know, that woman that said that it was the best movie she'd ever effing seen. Mm -hmm. Those kind of things happen. It's something since you have kids you know this as well as anybody but when you care about somebody and you really want them to enjoy something the way that you enjoyed it and you show it to them and they don't it always hurts and i i remember with my friend bride of frankenstein had just come out on dvd and i was just like oh my gosh you're gonna oh this movie is so so great i mean holy cow they don't make movies like this anymore and when you talk something up that much you're asking for, for it disaster. it's a recipe for disaster but yeah, I showed it to him and he was just, it wasn't the same response as when we watched Planet of the Apes. He just, it didn't do anything for him. And again, expectations. We always talk about that. The expectations are also part of it. And when you tell somebody this is the greatest movie ever or this will change your life or, you know, you're going to have to change your underwear. Maybe that's not the best thing to say to somebody if you want them to realistically enjoy the movie. Yeah, it is hard to enjoy something when you build expectations up really high. And we, we talked about that in our pre-Avengers thing, I believe, where we were just worried about getting too excited about this film because we were afraid that we would go and then, you know, our expectation would be too high. And no matter how good it was, it couldn't be good enough. Either we 
didn't get our expectations that high or it was just so good that it didn't really matter what our expectations were. But it worked out with that film. But other times it hasn't. And I think we've talked about those on uh, the show sometimes too. So what other shows have you seen? Did you see that Snow White and the Huntsman film? I didn't. I was working that whole weekend and I told my niece I was going to take her to it. We'd hit a matinee or something. Mm -hmm. And I worked like 14 hours on the one day and like 16 hours on the next day. And so I was completely wiped out. I'd I'd like to see it. It did well. Mm -hmm. And that's something we didn't really talk about in the last couple episodes because, you know, you don't know when you record something during the opening weekend. Right. But I mean, Avengers will have done $600 million by the end of its run. Battleship... It was a huge flop. I mean, Yay! It, it, I think I mentioned it in the Battleship episode, but yeah, it lost more money than John Carter did. Good. And Hopefully that teaches somebody something. That's the thing is, do people learn lessons from failures? And if so, did they learn the right lessons? And I, I, I don't know. We've had a bunch of movies open much lower than everybody expected that they would this summer. And I think Snow White and the Huntsman was the only one that overperformed. Well, besides Avengers, where people were like, well, it'll probably do. What about Madagascar 3? Madagascar 3 did all right, like I said, but it, it didn't do better than Madagascar 2, even though it's in 3D and, it, you know, it, movies cost more and you can see them in IMAX and, you know, all that stuff. If you compare, you know, how many tickets were sold, which our, our, our film professor used to always say they need to stop with the box office thing and start talking about how many tickets a movie sells, because that is the actual deciding factor. When you look at how many tickets Sound of Music sold versus Lost in Space, then shut up about Lost in Space. But it's just... Are people talking about Lost in Space? Well, in those days, they were. <laughs> okay, maybe not. Maybe maybe it was just me. Oh, <laughs> well, Lost in Space was a bad movie, sir. <laughs> we could do a whole episode on these first installments of series that don't get series. Mm-hmm. But they've announced that they're making a sequel to Snow White and the Huntsman already. already, 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 already. And I haven't seen it. I will see it, I think. Just because, I'd, like I said, I, I told You'll see this. Are you going to see the first movie before you see that sequel? No, I mean, I'll see Snow White and the Huntsman. Uh, <laughs> I, here's another thing that maybe we'll go into on our next episode, but I'm old enough now that I don't want to waste my time with something that I'm probably not going to enjoy. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we were in college, or at least me, since I wasn't out having sex all the time, I would go to whatever, you know, I'll just go to a movie. I I know this is going to be terrible, but I'm going to go anyway because it's it's one of the three things that you can do in this town. Yeah, and sometimes you were proven wrong. You're like, I know it's going to be terrible. And you go and you're like, well, Real Steel was actually good. I cannot believe they did it. But I I sort of forced you to go to that. You know, that's like when a girl drags you to a movie. True, but I mean, it happens. But for, for me now, they'll make a movie that I didn't care for. And then they make a sequel to it. And no matter how much people say, Men in Black 3 is awesome. Wrath of the Titans will change your life. I don't go. Uh I don't care. You know what I mean? You didn't earn me going to see the sequel. That's just something that has happened fairly recently. You know, people talked about how good Transformers 3 was. And I was like, then go see it again and blow your brains out afterward. Because I'm not going to go see it. And everyone, including you, talked about G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra is worth seeing. You know, it's not as bad as, as you thought it was. It's not as bad as the Transformers movies or whatever. But sorry, it looked like a Transformers movie. I'm not going to go to it. And now no one can go to the sequel. <laughs> but you know, I just see these things like uh, Underworld Awakening was so bad that if they make an Underworld... Bedtime? Whatever follows Awakening. Urinating. Breakfast? Breakfast. There you go. Underworld Breakfast. Uh, I'm not going to go. And I don't know that everybody is like that. Young people probably aren't like that because you hear a lot of people, we even lived through it when Star Wars Episode Two was coming out, that will say, I know it's made by the same people and stars the same people and have the same writer, but this one's going to be better than the last one. And you'll hear that, you know, it's like, I know Transformers 2 wasn't very good, but Transformers 3 directed by the same guy starring the same people and written by the same guy is going to be really good. It's just one of those things. Maybe once you reach a certain number of years, 
you shake your head and say, well, how do you figure? That was a roundabout way to say that you also didn't see Men in Black 3 then? I didn't. I, I didn't see Dark Shadows because I didn't enjoy the last Tim Burton, Johnny Depp collaboration. I may, I, you know, I'll go see that at the Dollar Theater maybe because my expectations are so low. Oh, geez, that looked like a turd. And it didn't do well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I would actually see Men in Black 3 maybe when it's at the Dollars we can go or something. Probably but, because I never really saw Men in Black 2. I mean, I saw parts of it, but I don't... There are times, uh, Mr. Data, I, which I envy you. I don't know how I missed it. Maybe I just realized as I saw the commercials, you know, this is going to suck. But uh, yeah, I never... I, I loved Men in Black 1. I really enjoyed that when it came out. Somehow I... Like when Matrix came out, really enjoyed Matrix, was not interested at all in seeing Matrix 2 or 3. You never saw them? Never saw them. Wasn't interested. I looked at that and said, no, the story's over. Nothing is over! Nothing! What are you going to tell me now? It's over. This guy is invincible. Well, that's another conversation that we could have. It's like, how do you do a sequel? Uh, and, and usually sequels are a remake of the first film. Mm -hmm. And with Matrix sequels... Especially with Men in Black 2. Yeah, with, with a lot of movies. But with the Matrix sequels, they tried to do something different. But when you end with your character practically becoming a god, where do you go from there? And basically the answer is, uh, forget about that last part. Uh. We're just going to go back on that. I mean, and, you know, they explained around it by saying, well, the robots, they evolved too. And now they're super, 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 super strong. Yeah. Every once in a while, there's a movie and you can tell it wasn't intended to have a sequel. And they have to somehow figure out a sequel to it. And when I heard that they were making a sequel to Snow White and the Huntsman, Having not seen it, I, I don't know where they can go with that. But I would assume that they do the stuff with the apple and the queen turning into the old witch and Snow White going into a coma or whatever it is and the kiss bringing her out and they live happily ever after. And how do you follow that? Well, something has to happen to unhappily everything. And I hate it in a sequel where the guy ends up with the girl at the last movie or whatever, and they've come up with some stupid reason to break them up in the second movie just so they can get together by the end of the second movie. And then they break them up again at the start of the third movie. Does that happen? I would hope that they, by the third movie, they're just like, well, sorry, she was killed in a threshing machine accident. <laughs> so there's a new love interest now. I don't know. It, it, uh, filmmaking is hard, and it's a collaboration, and not everybody involved in the collaboration is creative. And when you get a bunch of number crunchers and executives and a me first kind of people that are having an influence on your movie, it's a miracle when you get movies like Avengers or, you know, Dark Knight, things like that, where everything works, you know, everything worked in those movies. And, uh, you know, the Pixar films for the most part have been anomalies. So like, how do they manage to be as good as they are? And part of it is that they make these movies with care and they take their time and they work their asses off from what I've they, seen. They avoid outside influences, it seems. The kind of influences that say, hey, uh, we haven't been selling as many cars as uh, we'd like to. So let's make another Cars movie, please. Yeah, what? Pixar would never do that. They avoided those things for so long. And then you see when they finally gave in, what happened? You yeah. got your the weakest. Only, yeah, the only weakest. unsuccessful Pixar film. Unsuccess yeah, the first time that they blew it. And we'll have to see what happens if they're going to have more sequels to come. Brave, luckily, isn't one of those. This may be our last great Pixar film, or maybe it won't be. I don't know. We'll have to see what happens. Yeah, we'll, we'll go see that, right? Yeah, I'm sure that'll probably be the next episode is us talking about Brave because we'll be going to see that soon. Every commercial on the Disney Channel, on Nickelodeon, etc., every commercial is about Brave these days. Well, have they shown you too much? I don't think so. But you and I had a conversation about what we thought the movie was about because it's not like they've been keeping it a secret, but they don't spell it out for you. Yeah, they sure don't. And I, I've enjoyed that. Oh, boy, I hate it when a movie trailer has to tell you the whole beginning, middle and end. And I, we did a whole episode about yes, that, too. We did. But at the same time, like I was talking about Prometheus before. They did very little to let you know what Prometheus was about in the trailers, the ad campaign. They would shoot things that were specifically for the ad campaign that, had not, that weren't in the movie. 
And that, which is an interesting way to go, you know, it's like, let's create a mystery, let's create curiosity, but that only takes you so far. Yeah, you've got to hook people, get them to come to your story. Uh, That's why they say, in a world. A movie that I really would like you to see, but it's the same way as showing somebody Bride of Frankenstein, Cabin in the Woods. As far as, I don't know, the, the movie was done in 2009, and it just got released in 2012. So it had a ton of trouble in the post-production and the studio going bankrupt and then them deciding we'll make it in 3D and then them deciding that they weren't going to release it at all and et cetera, et cetera. But that one, I only saw one trailer for it. And that trailer seemed to give away way, way too much. And you did you see that trailer? Maybe. I don't did you know. see I a, trailer. a trailer. Um, then I guess they had a, a later trailer that I avoided because somebody had seen it before me and they said, oh, dude, have you seen that new Cabin in the Woods trailer? And I said, no. And they said, don't see it. And, and so I didn't see it. And then I was surprised by some of the things in the movie that other people weren't surprised by. But that one, it's one of those things. How do you market a movie that is tricking its audience into thinking it's one thing, but is actually something else? But if you don't tell them that it's something else, they'll just think it's like every other, you know, slasher in the woods, evil dead ripoff that they've right. ever seen. They had a really uphill battle on that. What do you do? And basically they just said from the from the director of Cloverfield and Joss Whedon, the creator of Buffy the Vampire Slayer or whatever, you know what I mean? Maybe they should have held it off till after Avengers and it would have done even better. Yeah, right. But might as well have. They let it for three years as is. With a movie like that. I'd love to show it to you, but it seems to me that the more you love horror movies, the more you're going to enjoy that movie. Mm -hmm. And you when, just said you're not a horror movie guy. Well, I like them all right. I'm just not a huge fan like you um, who watched horror films endlessly and had a whole website where you rated horror films and I did. gave them however many skulls they earned and so forth. I mean, that that's not the level that I take it to. Is that movie in dollar theaters yet? Is it passed? It just went away. Uh, if it goes to the dollar theater, I'll let you know. Yeah, that'd be good. I'd like to see it in a theater. It would be nice. But yeah, it was something like that. I don't know how that movie could have made more money except for by word of mouth. Right. And I don't know. Do you have it there? How well it did? It did $41 million, which I don't think is bad. Probably not. It all depends on what the budget was, I guess. We'll never know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, if they spent out their ears, then $41 is not good if it cost $55 million. But if they were careful with the money, then, yeah, that's fairly good for a, for a horror movie. Or horror, me doing air quotes, movies, don't necessarily bring in big bucks usually. Well, it doesn't matter because they're usually so inexpensive to make. Right. And they have a guaranteed audience. Mm -hmm. People that go see whatever is horror, no matter who's in it, you know, no matter if it's from somebody that they've heard of, it's just the genre. It sells itself. And on that one, I wish, I wish that we were still in the era of video cassette or video rentals because movies like The Terminator or Austin Powers or something like that became giant hits on video because of word of mouth, because of, oh my gosh, you got to see this movie. And Cabin in the Woods is perfect for that with one of those, oh, you've got to see this movie. It's like, oh, who's in it? It doesn't matter. Just watch it. <laughs> <laughs> if it gets on Netflix, maybe people will uh, see it. I don't know. Anyhow, uh, we had a different thing that we were going to talk about in this episode, but we didn't. Yeah. It was just summer up till now kind of thing. Have you seen any movies besides Avengers this summer? Not a new movie. I don't think. I think that's the only one I've gone to so far. Oh, well, I saw Battleship. <laughs> um, of course, we talked about that too. That, that was an, an interesting experience. Because the trailer for Battleship was so shitty. I, don't, I mean, is there a better word for what it was? No, it's a good word. And I just didn't want to see that at all. And then when I saw it, I was like, well, it wasn't as shitty as the trailer. And again, somebody purposely marketed that movie in that way. They, they made a trailer. That was their job. And they made it look worse than it was. <laughs> like, for example, Madagascar 3 came out and apparently it's really good. I don't believe it. It got an A cinema score, but wow, that trailer was utter crap. I mean, and, and you know what? People respond to different things. 
But how I, many times can they keep bringing out that I like to move it, move it song before you just want to shoot any person who sings it? I don't know. But if I were a judge, I would throw out any case where somebody committed a crime after hearing <laughs> I move it, move it thing. Oh, I don't know. It looked awful. And yet it did well. Or it opened well. Nobody gives a crap if you go see it the next week. And the people that saw it liked it. And so I guess it accomplished what it was I going guess. for. I guess. My but kids are totally uninterested in that film. But there's hope for the future then. My daughter came and said that to me the other day. She's like, when that Brave movie comes out, we are going to see that. Motherfucker. You got it. And I was like, you sure you want to go see Brave? You don't want to go and see Madagascar or Ice Age? Is this a test, Daddy? She's like, no! She just thought I was an idiot for even saying so. And I don't know if she knows the difference. If she is like most people who just go, oh yeah, I love them Pixar movies like Madagascar and Over the Hedge. They're great. Or if she knows the difference between a Pixar and the rest, if she looks at that and goes, oh... Pixar did Brave, so it was probably going to be good, whereas Madagascar was just another one of those stinking DreamWorks films. Well, we'll see on Brave. People seem to think that it's a guaranteed blockbuster, and I I don't know. I, In my family, it will be the, a blockbuster. Every one of us will go to see that. I hear you, but you also have a son, like an adolescent son, and will a boy want to see this movie? And, you know, again, who cares? He goes to whatever you take him to. But <laughs> it, it, it takes... There have been trailers for movies that weren't made for me, but made me want to see the movie anyway. And I, I think on this very show, we talked about that Winnie the Pooh mm -hmm. trailer from last year or whatever, where I was just like, wow, I've never given a crap about Winnie the Pooh, but I so want to see that and have a baby. I still have never seen that. And that's fine. I haven't seen it either. I actually would like to. The though. movie didn't do well. And so they made a mistake of trying to appeal to adults, I guess, with the ad campaign rather than kids. Rather than putting a lot of fart jokes on there and Tigger bouncing all over Eeyore's head. And yeah, Tigger I guess. Ripping his tail off and poking his eyes out with the nail that goes to tack it in. That kind of stuff. That they should have showed, showed more of that. I guess. I, you know, there are people whose jobs it is to anticipate how something's going to do and, you know, all this stuff. And they're wrong as many times as they're right. People don't know. And it's a huge shock when something fails that everybody said it was going to be successful or the opposite. And with Brave, I don't know. Because it's Pixar, I'll go see it. And because I'm an adult who can relate to somebody that doesn't pee standing up, I'll still get invested in the character, even though she's a girl and all this. Uh, well, the one thing about her is they do make her very manly for a girl. I mean, her favorite thing to do is archery, and she's a rough and tumble girl. She's not just a... She does have lots of crazy, curly, long red hair, <laughs> but she's got three twin brothers, and they have, like, these weird freaking girly hairdos <laughs> going on. I don't know what that's all about, so maybe they just switch the roles, but... She's very much a tomboy, you could say. So maybe boys will look at that and think, yeah, maybe she's a girl, but she fights with a sword and she shoots arrows and hits the one right down the middle of the other. That's rad. So the, the prevailing wisdom, quote unquote, in Hollywood is that boys won't go see something with a female central character. Mm -hmm. And I think we've seen that proved wrong in the past. Like when you and I were kids and we went and saw and loved Little Mermaid or with Hunger Games or something like that. But or that that Tangled film did it did much well better yeah. than Princess and the Frog did. And somebody somewhere says, well, it's because we changed the title and tricked those boys into and going made it to in see CG it. instead of yeah. traditional animation. Somebody or traditional anim somebody says, well, because we beefed up the Zachary Levi part and boys were tricked into thinking that it was about this dude instead of about Rapunzel. But no one knows for sure. My mm -hmm. opinion is it was a good movie. Yeah. And because it was My a good movie, too. people went to see it that wouldn't have gone to see it if other people told them, eh. And the idea of making a good movie first and then seeing how to market it seems really antiquated nowadays. And, and you know, with Cabin in the Woods is a perfect example. It's like, how do you market something like that? And yeah, I, I don't know. If they <laughs> waited and said from the writer of Avengers, 
maybe it would have done better, but who cares? I, I, I loved it and I'm a selfish person. You know, it's like, that's all that matters is that I loved it and that, yeah, it's what, and it made its money back. It's what we said uh, when Avengers was coming out. We don't care if it's a big hit. We just want it to be a good movie. And uh, it's the same kind of thing. You don't care if Cabin in the Woods is a big hit, but it was a good movie. So you're glad you saw it. It's all that matters. Yeah. Well, I, I've talked a lot longer than I intended to. I'm sorry. But uh, we've got another episode. And then we can talk about another movie that we went and saw instead of talking about movies that we didn't go If we saw. had another episode, you wanted to talk about movies that you saw, would, would you? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening, folks. I'm Big Anklevich. Oh, that's awful. And I'm Rich Hatfield. <laughs> Bye. See you. That Gets My Go is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. Apparently, the creative in Creative Commons doesn't mean anything. To all four people that listen to this. <laughs>